Next week, we may see an end to seven years of unresolved Republican debate over how to repeal or repeal and replace Obamacare. While consensus is still out of reach on issues like coverage requirements and cuts to Medicaid, the Senate leadership wants to schedule a vote. So what does that mean for New York and for the state's Republican representatives who have been fielding some criticism from angry voters over the last few months? Kinderhook Republican Congressman John Faso joins me now to talk about the situation. It's great to speak with you. Thank you, Susan. Nice to be with you again. I wanted to begin with a personal question. What have the last few months been like for you? You're a freshman uh, congressman, and clearly your district is split on this issue. Well, look, I didn't run to, uh, to uh, try to work on easy issues. I'm running to, <laughs> uh, I ran last year to try to address the difficult issues that our country faces. And there's no doubt that health care is an extremely contentious, difficult issue. It is something that people feel deeply personally. They feel uh, because it affects them and their families. And it's an issue that uh, I think no matter who you talk to, people have strong opinions about. So inevitably, there is going to be controversy about any type of change in the status quo. Um, and also there's, there's controversy about the status quo. I have uh, many, many people who've, who've got a lot of fears and anxieties about uh, potential changes, and they're making their voices heard, and that's fine. And also there are many people that are very concerned about the current system and where it is headed, and uh, they have fear and anxiety about that. So, um, you know, we're getting it from all sides, but that's just the nature of this process. I'm going to be asking you about the status quo in a minute, but um, I I wanted to ask you about your willingness to engage protesters in policy discussions. I have seen you do this, and it's impressive. Um, at the same time, you are being criticized for not engaging protesters at town halls, or engaging people in a town hall, I should say. Tell us what the difference is between going into um, the lion's den of protesters at speaking engagements, which you have done, and I've seen you do many times, yep. and holding a town hall. Well, the the fact of the matter is is that uh, this is an extremely contentious issue. Many of the uh, proponents of quote unquote town halls are part of an organized nationwide political effort to basically, if you've seen what's happened around the country, uh, these. Uh, many of these forums have been simply shouting sessions, and they have not been sessions where people have been able to ask a question and hear an answer. That's why uh, I routinely make myself available uh, to speak to media, to uh, meet with individual constituents in individually or in small groups. I've met with over 300 constituent meetings since January. I've had a televised, live, one-hour televised town hall on the public television station where there was a live studio audience where constituents could uh, get, a, get a ticket to that event uh, from the television station. So uh, I have made myself available repeatedly. In this polarized political environment, though, I don't think it's particularly useful for uh, uh, people who want to go into a a town hall with an organized uh, national political effort to yell and scream and wave signs and for people who might be my supporters to get into that hall and yell and scream and wave signs. I think that our political atmosphere is too highly charged and polarized, and that would not be a good thing to add to that polarization. Let so me... what I try to do is meet with people to talk calmly and rationally with them about their concerns and to uh, let them vent their frustration or their fears and, and let them hear from me a, a direct answer. And I think that is an effective means of communicating with uh, folks throughout our district. As I said, your willingness to engage protesters has uh, is on the record. Um, you have been criticized, though, for seeming to approach this issue, health care, too cerebrally without enough compassion for people who will lose their health care under the plan that you support? And I'm hoping that you will respond to that. Well, it, it's an interesting question. I, um, I, what I try to do is study the issues in very great depth 
And healthcare is a very complicated topic. There are many ramifications and nuances uh, to all of these policy proposals. And uh, regardless of, uh, uh, I I think it's it's probably if that's a, if that's a criticism that I'm too cerebral and I've thought I'm thinking too much and working too hard on the issue. Well, I'll accept that. Well, not com- but not compassionate. Well, no, I I actually I I feel deeply compassionate for people and their anxiety and their individual circumstances. I've met with parents who have disabled children and they're very concerned. I've met with people who are who've told me that uh, they've been able to uh, receive health care for the first time on a on a meaningful basis because of the ACA. And uh, yeah, I'm very deeply compassionate for people who have uh, these concerns, and these are these are very real concerns that people have. I'm also very concerned about the fact that our country is going broke, and if if we continue on the trend that uh, we are on right now, our country is going to be in a very very dire financial situation in a few short years. In fact, within 10 years, if we continue on this trend line. The second or third largest item in the whole federal budget is going to be interest on the debt after Social Security and Medicare. So interest on the debt, if we continue to roll over our, our debt uh, in, a, in this fashion, it's going to pose extraordinary challenges for uh, um, the federal government and all of us as citizens. And the people who will be most harmed if we have a debt crisis in our country I wanna, are the poor and, the, and those who are uh, the most disadvantaged. I want to ask you about the Better Care Reconciliation Act. That's the Senate version of health care. They're supposed to vote on it next week. Do you think they will muster the votes to pass it? I really, at this point, I don't. I don't think they have the votes uh, to pass it. But at the same time, uh, Senator McConnell should not be underestimated. There are some provisions in the Senate legislation that I have some concerns about as a New Yorker. And so I am observing what they're doing closely, and uh, I'm trying to understand all the policy uh, parameters that are contained within that legislation. I think one of the most important things, though, to keep in mind, and you hear this over and over from people, that Medicaid is being cut. In actuality, Medicaid's growth is being reduced, but the total amount that is going to be spent by state and and federal governments on Medicaid is actually going to continue to grow each year. And so uh, this is kind of a a false uh, analysis when people – you hear people say Medicaid is being cut and everyone's going to be thrown out in the street. It is completely false. Medicaid is is being – the growth of Medicaid is going to be slowed, and we're doing that for very strong and serious financial reasons that the federal government doesn't have the resources to pay uh, for the rate of growth that Medicaid now is experiencing. Maybe we can talk about that another time. I I did want to ask you uh, about FASO Collins. If health care reform doesn't go through, will you push FASO Collins, Collins FASO, whatever it's called, as either a standalone bill or linked to something else? Certainly. I'm going to look for every opportunity I can to eliminate Nelson Rockefeller's worst mistake, which is imposing the state's part of the state's Medicaid burden on homeowners and property taxpayers. We're the only state in the country that does it this way to this extent. And it's part of the reason why people and jobs continue to flee upstate New York. And that is, to me, the single biggest issue that we face in upstate New York. Not enough jobs and people continue to leave in part because of high taxes. Hope to talk soon. Congressman John Faso is a Republican from Kinderhook. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. This program is presented by WCNY Syracuse.